Welcome to So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. If you are trying to evaluate whether real estate is the right career for you, wondering whether you are doing the right things to launch into quick success, or looking for tips and tools you can use today to become a more productive agent, this is your podcast. Welcome to So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. This is Season 3, Finding Inspiration. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Meredith Fogel, and we have a special guest today. But before I introduce our special guest, I want to thank our listeners because we just broke 100,000 downloads, and I'm so excited for that milestone and so grateful for every one of you who listens to us, all of the kind words, reviews, and ratings. Um, Just very, very pleased. It means the world to us. So Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have another really good show for you today. So today we have Janine Sasso with us. And Janine is uh, is an agent who is dear to my own heart in that she also is a hyper-local agent and a geofarming expert. And I'm going to let Janine introduce herself in a second, but I will say that every mastermind and call that I've been on with you, Janine, you bring such a wealth of knowledge innovative ideas and information to the calls that I'm really excited for our audience to get to learn from you today. So without further ado, Janine, who is the hyperlocal agent and has a cool website that I'll let her tell you about. Um, and it's just an innovative businesswoman. Tell us about you, Janine. I am so excited to be here. A hundred thousand downloads. Can I just say, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. So this one is something I've looked forward to since we scheduled this interview because just as much as you know, I love hyperlocal everything, so do you. So I think there's gonna be like so much amazingness coming out of this little meeting of the minds here. Because at the end of the day, right, I'm like, we're all in the same business here, real estate, selling houses, connecting with people, and doing it hyper-locally has so many advantages. So introducing myself real quick, I've been in the business since 2015 on my own. I've been around real estate a little bit before that, and I just really connected with the field in itself. I am an educator. Um before I had my real estate license, so I was a teacher. And the learning part of it has been, I think, really helpful for the business side of it. So I built my business essentially really quickly, doubled year after year after year, and have started now ventures of my own, sharing what has worked for me, what hasn't worked for me. So yes, I'm sharing not just the, oh my gosh, amazing things, such as I just broke into the top 50 in my company. I was a huge company. Mm-hmm. So having, you know, that top 50 spot is amazing. And the reason I say it is not a bragging one, but I'm saying it so you understand it works because I'm in it. I'm not just telling everybody, try this without me having tried it yourself. And I know this is something that you are so passionate about as well. Like, tried, true, proven. We are doing it ourselves. And this is not theory. This is all actionable stuff that we're sharing with other agents. So I'm excited to be here. And um, personally, I have two little kids. I have a four-year-old at the time of recording this and a 10-year-old. So I am in my car a lot. (laughs) And um, I still manage to run a really, really successful business. And part of it because it's hyperlocal. Yeah, it's I, it's it's really um, one of the places I think where you kind of can combine elements of your personal life and your business life being a hyperlocal agent. And congratulations on being in that top fifty. That is a huge accomplishment. That's that's awesome. Were you always hyperlocal? Did you start out with that kind of a, a theory of real estate, or did you kind of find your way into it? I kind of found my way into it. And I started out probably like most other agents trying to do everything, right? I've tried open houses all over the place. I've tried um, shooting videos. I've had a lot of rentals all over the place that I had to like drive to meet, meet people. 
and it became really taxing on not just also me, but I would need to bring my kids oftentimes. Mm. And talk about mom guilt, having the kids in the car for three hours, you know, while you're going from house to house to house, this is not fun. And it was just something where I figured, how can I become a little bit more strategic? And I started with farming on that note. And then I really realized I was able to leave for a listing appointment or to show a buyer five minutes before I had to be there. <laughs> yes. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm like, I don't have to pay the babysitter to drive 30 minutes while I do enjoy some of the alone time in the car. <laughs> because have little kids, right? But it was still like, I had to pay somebody to be there to watch the kids. I, you know, I had to pay for the help. Sometimes I had family members able to help out, but the drop and run was so stressful. Mm. I was just like, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't working. I mean, it was working, but it was really, really taxing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is, it's such a luxury when you can like walk outside of your house and walk to your listing. That's, that's a pretty cool part of being a farmer sometimes. So how did you learn about farming to begin with? Was it trial and error or did you find some resources? So a lot of it was trial and error. When I started, I came here. So I don't know if you're going to catch on to the accent, but I was born and raised in Germany. And I didn't go to school here. I didn't grow up here. Um, I didn't have kids old enough at that time to be in a school setting to meet other people. And on top of that, I was nannying and watching um, other people's children in a completely different part of town. Not even the same town, like town to town's over. So there was, you know, a lot of time spent a full-time job nannying. So trying to do all these things in, in one area, getting to know things was, was hard. And the only two places I was, was the place I, I was working 40 hours a week nannying in the place I lived. And there was not a lot of time to get to know other school districts, other things. So I started to just kind of trying to get to know my own neighborhood better, especially since I had the kids. I wasn't even aware where were the parks, like something mm-hmm. simple that I just started to to explore. And I started to explore my area with the eyes of a, you know, person that wants to get to know the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, There are two Facebook groups that I, you know, joined. And you start seeing the conversations people are having. And for example, a lot of these conversations were based on, hey, we have this and this model, wondering if anybody took down a wall or wondering if somebody did an addition, right? Mm. So those were some of the conversations I started noticing and I just really leaned into these conversations Mm. and started educating myself. Mm. So the neighborhood I am in right now, I farm, um, I have two farms, one is my original farm of 3,500 homes and one is an expansion that I'm just now getting into of 1,500 homes. But my original farm is very cookie cutter. So I started to look at the floor plans. I started to learn about the model names, about when they were built, just in detail, you know, knowledge of the area, which was massively helpful to understand how pricing works. And that's another benefit of hyperlocal agents. You start seeing average price ranges. I'm like, oh, this model typically goes somewhere around this to this price. Um, that subdivision over there has larger homes. You know, these are going to go for a higher price. Having this knowledge about it, people love an expert, right? Mm-hmm. It's that comparison from a general doctor telling you you have a flu and somebody looking at your brain. Like you always mm-hmm. look for that expert advice. And that was a positioning move that I did a little bit unconsciously, but it worked out so, so well where people now are like, hey, you know everything about this neighborhood. You know, we're thinking about selling or we're thinking about buying. And it positions you now in a way that no, you know, no Zillow can compete with, which is amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You become that, that expert that people get to know and want to, um, want to consult with. So when you started with like that, take the, the, the Facebook group, for example, where people were asking about, um, you know, did anybody take a wall down? And you said you, you did some research first. How did you, and I know some of our audience members are probably wondering, how did you go from being kind of an observer or part of that group to actually jumping in and converting that into business? A lot of it is just 
conversations, right? So right now it is all about conversations, conversations, conversations. And sometimes it's the little subtle things that you say in these conversations. It might be, hey, um, wondering if somebody has an amazing roofer, one of my clients is looking to do the roof in the neighborhood. Well, the terminology client itself, right? It sparks an interest with people mm-hmm. and be like, oh, what do you do? And people are naturally curious, so they're always coming back to my profile. So while my profile is mostly me as a person, the social aspect, there are certain things in there that state I'm an agent. I'm a real estate agent, right? So this is some of that leverage that comes in on the social aspect of it. But also just having this book of contractors, this book of service providers, There's a lot of people always asking, hey, how about somebody that repairs this, fixes this, does this? So by simply giving out, willingly giving out my contacts, people are starting to see my name and they're like, hey, she's very helpful every single time. So that was one of the things I've done in those groups. And it's not always about putting my name with real estate in there. Sometimes it's just for them to see my name Mm -hmm. over no, no so that mindset of, of giving first and creating visibility through conversation, it sounds like was, was a place that you started really smart. Yeah. And it sounds like it was genuine too, which people can, can, uh, can see when it is. Right. So giving was a huge, huge part of that. And then the other thing I implemented early on was a neighborhood garage sale. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah. So neighbor, the neighborhood garage sale has now grown into a six figure strategy which is like mind-blowingly amazing to see how something that started so small has blown up and it's made it onto the local television networks. So it's cool. really, really cool. So the neighborhood garage sale, I started out walking 100 flyers to my nearest neighbors and said, hey, I, I would love to organize a community garage sale. If you want to participate, just send me an email, right? It was very, very basic. And I had 10 people in that very first year say, that's a great idea. Awesome. I'm like, 10 people said yes, right? It's like 10%. (laughs) And the very important thing was anything neighborhood related is to make sure you're building your own email list for that one. Mm. Now I had, you know, I walked these flyers. I invested a lot of time and I had my stroller with me because I had this little guy that needed to be with me. Mm -hmm. So, I delivered the flyers, but then the following year, I had those 10 people that said yes, and I was able to email them and say, hey, I'd like to do it again, and you participated last time. I'm wondering, are you interested to participate again? Mm. And a lot of them said yes, and then I added, you know, 100. Actually, at that point, I had a mailing route. I upgraded to one of the mailing routes to the Every Door Direct Mail system from the United States Postal Service. Mm -hmm. And I mailed out my first mailer for uh, 400 extra homes. So I had those 10 people on that one route and then I picked another one and I reached, you know, 410 people Mm -hmm. and grew. And people were starting to notice that there's a combined effort behind it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it was just adding, you know, adding new marketing strategies on Mm -hmm. layering it on, making sure that, I really built on my momentum. And that's another thing that I think really is important. Once you have momentum, run with it. Yes. Yeah. So how did you spin that? So the garage sale, that started with a a relatively small group of people. And then you added and added. What else were you doing? And how did you kind of spin that momentum that you had gained into additional marketing and leverage, which you were already doing? So a lot of it was signage, open houses, Every open house that came available in my farm from my company, um, I asked them, was my listing right? But I'm like, hey, I'm I'm ready to set an open house. I'm ready to set an open house. And I would do back-to-back open houses, especially in my farm, over and over and over. And I would start to get to know people. Mm -hmm. And that was something that really helped me to understand what is this community made out of, right? Who are these people? Why are they potentially looking to sell their house? What is their story? Mm. There are so many different reasons why people move. So understanding how can I help these people the best possible way became really important to me. And marketing the listings and being a little different 
just naturally came to me, it seemed like. If somebody was doing an open house, you know, for two hours, I would have one for four hours. Mm. If somebody was doing an open house from 11 to 2, I would always make sure I, I picked, like, a, a longer time slot, and I would go longer. Hmm. It was always that little extra to make sure, like, I was still open. I was still going to be the last conversation they went home to, and they remembered. That's and then from right. there, it's, like, layering on marketing, right? Like, one of the best tips I always give agents is, like, please do not put up the signs the brokerage gives you without your name on it. Mm. You sign the name, your brand. People need to see you, not the advertisement for the brokerage. Right. right. You know, so it just was getting my name out there. This was my mini billboard because I didn't have much I was able to afford. I didn't have a marketing budget. I got my license. I'm like, okay, cool, real estate. Somebody give me leave. It's <laughs> right. like this. Right, right. So I'm like, okay, what can I do? Because I have no money saved up, right? So it's just like those little subtle tweaks to put my name on my open house sign. And that became my billboard. I would put it out at 7 or 8 in the morning mm -hmm. to make sure people go into Starbucks, people go to the donut shop, people go to the bakery. I wanted them to just see my sign out there mm -hmm. at my early morning drive, even if they had no intention to come to the open house. Yeah. Janine Sassel, Janine Sassel, Janine Sassel. Love and uh, I can still do this to this day that I put up my signs early and I pick them up late. Love yes. it. Love it, love it. So smart. It's almost like, a, you know, it's a very reasonable cost um, initiative, almost like an organic kind of a feel to it. But what you then did was you just kept growing and growing and kind of snowballing that, that effort into bigger and bigger things. So let's talk about the direct mail for a second, because you, you've talked about, you know, your postcards, you've talked about signage, but I want to talk about mail for a minute. And this is something that you include in your website which is the hope the I can talk the hyperlocalagent.com. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. So visit the website to check out more about this. But, but and when I first told Janine what we were going to cover today, she's like, oh my gosh, we're going to be here for three hours. And I'm like, we're going to have to hit the big points, but there's so much more. And we might have to do a part two of this, but with um, the mailers, you have a portal on your website that is called mailer Boot Camp. So talk to us about, why direct mail is important, and what what's your boot camp all about? So there's a couple components, just very similar to you. We have so many similarities, which I, I think know. is why the two of us connect so well. Yeah. But you, I am a published author. Like, your book on geographic farming, right? If people haven't checked it out on Amazon, I hope they do. Thank you. I have put together a book on using real estate mailers because what I realized is that I was able to leverage mailers. Remember, I started out with 100 flyers and all of a sudden I was able to, you know, get a mailing route. And if you're looking at the cost, for example, the mailing route itself, the cost for it was, I believe, $100 roughly for the postage when I got started. And it cost me roughly about $100 for the print. So in order for me to reach you know, 400 households, I spent $200. Hmm. Now, I also said I had a full-time job. I have my full-time job income, not just to pay my bills, but if I had to eat ramen, I'm eating ramen because I would take those $200 extra and I would put that into that mailer campaign. Mm -hmm. I'd say, like, I want to send out that one mailer because 400 homes would have taken me three, four hours to walk to flyers Right? But now I was able to do it with the push of a button. So I was really intrigued by the entire system of leverage. So I did that, and I started getting some, you know, some business coming in as well, which then again, you have momentum, you hit momentum, you take it, you run with it. So my one mailing route grew to two. The cool thing is, I didn't dispense more effort. Mm. It took me the same amount of effort to reach now 800 homes than it did for me to you know, reach 400. Mm -hmm. And that was the point where I was hooked. I'm like, mm -hmm. this is phenomenal. I can't scale this to thousands of mailers, which now I do, without really spending more effort. Yes, I spent money, but I'm growing slowly. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, you know, um, the, the hair and the quotas story. Oh, yeah. I asked the quotas. I'm like, I am okay with slow, consistent growth yeah. over rapid growth that is just like, you know, people can't handle it. Yeah. So 
that is one of the things where I saw this working and I started getting obsessed with mailers. I think for you to master something, you know, I started really looking into mailers in a form that I know nobody in my marketplace was doing. Mm. The concept of direct mail, right? The call to action, the color schemes, um, everything that was catching on and also the biggest part behind it, how can I get them from a person that received a mailer to get them into my world of, you know, getting their email, getting their contact information. Because once I have their email, I can email them all day long. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to spend any more money mm-hmm. for that, you know, marketing. So it, I became really obsessed with how quickly can I grow my neighborhood marketing list. Because if the market is shifting, like we're experiencing right now, and let's say we do not want to spend money on mailers, I can turn to my list and I can use that without missing a beat in my marketing. Mm-hmm. And all these secrets are revealed in your book. So mm-hmm. make sure to pick the book up. Tell the audience, we're going to plug the book for a second. What's the book called, Janine? So the book is called Success with Real Estate Mailers. It's available on Amazon. And in that book, the very first page, I'm also going to invite you to the mailer boot camp. So let me invite you to that one right now. Mm-hmm. It's mailermombootcamp.com. And that boot camp is five days. Four of them is more workshop style in which I take apart everything mailer marketing and why I don't hire a company. There's actually a really specific reason out there mm-hmm. um, why I believe every small business owner should at least get started on their own before hiring it out. If you don't understand what's happening on your marketing end, you're always going to be at a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. So trying to break it down where people understand why we do the things we do makes them, again, I, again, educator, right? I'm coming from an education background. The more you know. The more you know, the better off you are. Mm-hmm. And that's what the boot camp um, you know, came, came to life for because I wanted to really educate agents because I saw agents being locked in 12 month contracts. I saw agents being very frustrated because they didn't get results. Yet here I was over there and I was getting leads left and right. And I'm like, why Why is nobody seeing the disconnect? You know, they're spending money and some of them are spending the last couple of dollars in their bank account. Yeah. And that was the part where I said, I, I can't just keep that info to myself. I'm gonna put it out there. And if somebody's going through the entire boot camp, they deserve to have all the details. Mm -hmm. Because so many times people sign up and they never show up, Mm -hmm. right? That part I can't help. But if somebody's willing to sign up to show up for themselves, to build that momentum into their own business, they can take it and they can run with it. Yeah. I love that so much. I love the generosity of spirit and sharing. And also, and I've said this on the show before, I can't tell you how many people who say that they are geo farmers come to me and say, I don't know, I've, I've sent, you know, five mailers out, nothing's happened. You know, it's like the, if they build it, if we build it, they will come mentality. And that's not how it actually works in real estate. <laughs> so you, it takes you a lot of effort. I mean, it really yeah. does. It takes a caring and, you know, genuine person to do it. So one of the campaigns we're currently doing is let us from Santa. So I have a mailbox I put up inside the neighborhood and it's literally the little kids dropping off a letter and we will write them back. Oh my gosh. Love it. But the community sees that and they appreciate it. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. What a great idea. All right. To shift a little bit, one of the things you also talk about, and this is on your website available too, is how to find a geographic farm. So let's hit like three to five of the big points on that that you'd like the audience to think about. So most people look at a farm and they think, okay, I'm just going to plant my roots here, right? And the first thing I want to do is find a profitable farm. So breaking it down step by step, most people will look at their neighborhood first, which I tell them, don't start there. Where you want to start is you want to start looking at the every door direct mail mailing route. I want you to look at the route for the reason that that mailing route will be your most affordable way to spend marketing money inside that neighborhood. 
Now you will notice that sometimes these mailing routes can be crazy. I mean, they do not match up with a subdivision, and most agents think that's a problem. Where I think this is not a problem. This is good. I'm okay with that because this is an easy, cheap way for me to get into a neighborhood without being, you know, out of money before I make an impact. Because mailing a regular letter is not cheap anymore, right? I mean, it gets really, really pricey. Mm -hmm. So trying to like, find little ways to cut costs just became really, really important to me from the beginning. So step one is always to start with your mailing route. Now, in that funding workshop that's on the website, and it's a completely free workshop that people can go through, I share with them the data that is in that tool itself. Again, you have to know who are you talking to. So I can really figure out who's living on that mailing route. I can be told, hey, 50% of the people are between 50 to 75 years old. That is huge information for me. If I'm trying to find a bunch of renters, it's probably not my neighborhood. Mm. So now it shapes my message to people that probably have owned their home for a certain amount of time because maybe they're getting ready to downsize. Right? So you really have to use some of the data in there, and this is where the profitable part comes in. If you are selecting a farm based on that data, you can now shape your message, which now makes you a lot more profitable. Mm. One of the simple formulas I use for it is your market plus your message equals your profit. Mm. And that is one of the marketing messages that I use inside the mailer bootcamp, and it's just so simple but so true. Think about an investor. An investor is trying to purchase a home, and you're hitting him with messaging that says, imagine bringing home your first baby, you know, or try to imagine playing with a dog in the backyard. The investor doesn't care. It's all about the hard numbers. So your method and your market don't, you know, don't match. Mm -hmm. Same with the first-time home buyer, and you're trying to tell him how this is an amazing investment, the ROI is so great, and, you know, the appreciation of the building will come in handy years down the road. The first-time buyer is going to look at you and be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Again, market and message, right? And it's so, so important that we match these two to really get to an amazing profit margin for the mailers. So that is, I guess, one of the, the biggest um, ones in there for that very first step when you select your farm. And then after that, yes, we do the same thing everybody teaches you outside, right? It's like how many homes are in the neighborhood. The cool thing is step number one already told you how many homes are on that route. Mm -hmm. Step number two, you go into your MLS, you draw a crazy-shaped rubber band, whatever that mailing route looks like, and you find your turnover rate, right? So you have... Number of sales divided by total number of homes, and you have your turnover rate right there. Now, farm size is important. I had somebody come to me and say, hey, I have a farm of 20 houses. That's not going to work. That's a hobby. That's just for you to spend <laughs> money for fun, but that's not a business. You cannot sustain yourself on that size. So really look at least to like 300 homes would be where you know everybody is currently at. Um, turnover rate. Turnover rate has been debated, you know, a lot, um, especially since COVID, our numbers have gone down a little. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we wanted to always see somewhere 6% or higher if you get into double digit. I'm always telling people, take your teeth in it because that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but even right now, if you find 5%, and you can see this might be working out for you, don't be afraid to go for 5%. If there's nothing around where you can say this makes sense, go and use what you have, right? And then from there, it's just really taking it and doing it. Be a caring person. Get to know the neighborhood. Send out a mailer. Um, have a follow-up system in place. If somebody says, yeah, I would love for, for you to tell me what my home is worth, what do you do next? If you don't have a process, you know, you're going to be struggling to keep up with all of the things that need to happen. And you have to sometimes stay in front of people for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, nobody rolls out of bed saying like, hey, I want to sell my house to, you know, today, come on over. This is a thought process. And I think sometimes, you know, us agents, we're very much like, hi, how are you? Can I sell your house? <laughs> hi, how are you? What's going on in your life? You know, it's that dating um, marriage, you know, mentality. Yes. I'm sure people have heard that analogy before. 
um, agents are always asking for the for the marriage first before putting the dating part in you know place. So right. state your prospects and then ask for the listing. Great advice. So let me ask you, I can't believe this has gone so fast. We're almost out of time already, but a couple more questions before we wrap up and such, such good stuff. And don't worry, audience, I'm going to encapsulate a lot of this into some show notes so you can go back through and listen. Um, when you said that you don't necessarily need to live in your farm to farm an area, or if part of that mail route is outside of your farm area, what do you say to agents who are like, oh, I don't know if I want to go over there because I live here instead? How do they combat that? Um, that perhaps misbelief? So when I have a mailing route that goes beyond their typical farm, I call it collateral damage. <laughs> I'm like, I have really, I mean, this is where your cost outweighs um, or the benefit outweighs the cost, mm. right? If I have 50 houses that are not in my subdivision, but they're on that route and I end up mailing to them, my cost is still going to be only a third if I had to put a stamp on it, a regular stamp. So having this route, the cost of it makes it so affordable and such a no-brainer to say, you know what, it's 50 extra people. Oh, well, they can, you know, they can just get my stuff as well. So that's the one where if you go beyond the subdivision without wanting it with the route, don't overthink it. Um, I actually just had somebody else reach out today asking me, excluding addresses. You cannot exclude addresses. And... People get very hung up on the fact that I don't want to send it to the agent. I have the mentality of go send it to the agent. It just shows them that there is an agent in town farming this area, and they will stay away from farming it because they feel that would be already competition. Mm -hmm. So it helps to sometimes have neighbors that are agents seeing your marketing because it will naturally keep the competition low for you. That's at least the mentality I have with it, personally. Good advice. I like that. And, and then um, you mentioned expanding your... Oh, I'm sorry, Janine. Keep going. I cut you off. No, it's okay. So the other, the only last one is, you know, some agents are a little worried about being, um, you know, in the farm. And, like, I always feel like I'm always on show. You know, it's always something. I'm mm. like, well, you're so different. Yeah. It's, it's really more of a be normal. You don't have to have the nicest house on the block. Just don't have a bunch of junk around, maybe. <laughs> you know, so that would be good. But just be a normal person, and um, it'll be okay. And if you live outside of the neighborhood, that's okay, as long as you care for the community, because that's all that matters. You can, I mean, how many of these signs have you seen where it says sister city or adopted mm. the city by, you know, and People are okay with it because it means that somebody else cares about where they are as much as they do themselves, which I think is awesome. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Great way to think about it. All right. Last question before we wrap up is you mentioned that you had expanded your farm area at some point. How did you choose the expansion farm and how would you recommend that agents think about selecting a farm into which to expand? Okay. So the expansion has been a little tricky on my second expansion. So my first couple expansions were within my own neighborhood. Again, 100 flyers, 400 on the first route, 800 on the second route, right? This was all still within one very condensed area. And it went pretty smoothly up to the 3,500 homes where now I have the north side of town as my farm. So that was my first original farm. Once I hit the 3,500 homes, this is where I maintained Last year, I got to the point of saying, it's time to grow. I feel like I have a pretty good handle on my 3,500 homes, on my events, on everything hyper-local that's going on there. I'm ready to grow. Question is where? So some of the considerations that I thought of was zip code. So for me, it was a zip code expansion. It was a zip code expansion because I also saw a little bit of people from my part of town moving into that zip code. Mm. Uh, I'm in a part of town where schools are very important and people pay, pay, you know, a certain amount of taxes for it. Mm -hmm. And I saw people who are oftentimes moving into a different part of town, either for the lower taxes, because the schools are different. They're not as highly desirable over there, but they either would get larger houses. So they would upsize once the kids were out of, you know, um, Out of high school, they would go there Hmm. to get everybody back under one roof in a larger home. Hmm. 
um, which wasn't interesting. You know, some of it is cultural, but yeah. you know, the other part is some of them are going into town homes, and then there's also a 55-plus community over there. Mm. There's a lot of different things that are really, you know, meshing well with my neighborhood, and it was the same zip code. So that's where I decided I'm going to expand there. It's the same town. And rather than saying, now I'm an agent in this town, in this town, in this town, I went for the zip code because I still have, you know, a lot more expanding I can do if I want to take over the entire town. And for the growth mentality, it was more of try to, you know, grow um, little and then expand a little more, expand a little more, expand a little more. Widen your radius, widen your circle. And that is the growth strategy that I'm following where, you know, you, you spread. And I had an interview with an agent that actually sends like 100,000 mailers. Wow. Month. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Wow. So, but I asked him because he's sending so many, how did you grow? And he compared it to growing like an amoeba. Hmm. So just you know, outward and growing more and more and more. And I thought this was the best analogy. So I kind of stuck with it. Yeah, that's a good one. Wow. So much for our audience to think about and consider everything from getting started in a very organic kind of a limited way, very reasonable in terms of expenditure to expanding in a giant kind of a sense and how to think about it rationally. So I know our audience is going to have follow-up questions for you and we only just like touched the tip of the iceberg with you. So I'm going to definitely have to have you back on the show again. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared and continue to share through your your website and the work that you do. Uh, For buyers or sellers though, who want to work with you, talk about where you're located. I don't think I asked you that. So I'm located in Illinois, just outside of uh, Chicago. So that is Northwest suburbs. It's my my stomping ground where I'm home anywhere from, you know, out, outer city um, all the way out to the suburban suburbia with the white picket fences. <laughs> and um, especially the hyper-local farm is Hoffman Estates, Illinois. Better known is probably Schaumburg that's right next to it. And that is where, you know, most of my, my sellers are. This is where I get a lot of my bio leads um, being referred to. Traffic is a hub where people like to be. And um, yeah. Fantastic. So, you know, you have your hyper local agent here in Janine, and you can see how incredibly smart she is in everything that she does. Now, for agents who have more questions about what you do, how you do it, want to pick your brain, become part of your mastermind, take your boot camp, um, figure out how to use direct mail better, or join a mastermind, you are at the hyperlocalagent.com. How can people find you on social media or otherwise? So the Hyperlocal Agent does have their own Facebook group. Uh, So a couple thousand agents in there. So feel free to mix and mingle. It's the Hyperlocal Real Estate Agent. And you can just type it in your form. Um, If you want to send me a friend request, I would love that. You can just type in my name, Janine Sasso. Very straightforward. You see me holding a copy of the um, Amazon book, at least at the moment, on my profile picture. So... You know, you got the right one. I don't think there's that many Jimmy Tassels out there. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, I'm an, I'm an agent. I am licensed. I am active. So if you type in my name and follow by the world real estate, you will find my videos. You will find my social handles. <laughs> and um, I'm no secret agent. So my <laughs> own, so, you know, come find me. Yes, go find Janine. I mean, wealth of information. I'm so glad that we connected. And you're so right. We have so much in common. It's been so fun to get to know you. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. And before I go, I want to thank everybody for listening again and thank our podcast sponsors who make this show possible. That is CLA Title, Peter Yanni of Home Team Mortgage, the Rosec Team with Embrace Mortgage, Paul Harsani of Eagle Bank. And please consider reaching out to our sponsors to support those who support us. Please also connect with us on social media and continue to leave us those kind words, reviews, or ratings. They mean the world to us. Thank you for listening. This has been So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. We'll see you next time. We are so grateful you joined us today. If you've benefited from the advice we share on the show, we hope you'll tune in to our next episode. Interested in learning more about my personal mentoring programs, our career kickstart course, 
or to pick up a copy of my book, Farming for Real Estate Agents, your step-by-step -step guide for becoming the go-to agent in your local market, visit www.meredithfogel.com and click the resources tab. If you are curious about becoming part of the List Realty family of agents, go to the www.thelistrealty.com website and click Careers from the About Us page or find me at the Meredith Global team on social media. Thank you for listening. This has been So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. We'll see you next time.